Hello, everyone. Today we have with us the absolutely amazing Holly Elmore, who currently is a researcher at Rethink Priorities, an effective altruism think tank, where she researches wild animal welfare. She completed her PhD at Harvard in evolutionary biology, where she was also the president of the Harvard University Effective Altruism Student Group. She has written a lot about rodent welfare and what we should do to humanely solve the problem of rodent infestation. To start us off, I wanted to ask, out of curiosity, how did we get to rodents becoming household pests? Just ever. Um, <laughs> um, well, it's like a really old problem. It comes with civilization, basically. I mean, once uh, humans were producing food scraps and something for rodents to eat that attracted them, and it's been pretty difficult to separate humans from rodents since then. Yeah, and by rodents, do we mean um, raccoons, squirrels, moles, uh, or is it mainly just rats? Mainly what I've written about is uh, end up being rats. Uh, the reason I, I wrote about uh, rodents so much is that it seemed like there was an opportunity to reduce the use of poisons for rodents or denticides, but, uh, and there is, and they're used for all sorts of rodents, but the, the biggest opportunities seem to be uh, using them again uh, to target the use of rodenticides against rats. Yeah, and how much do we know about rodent sent sentience? Um, they're mammals, uh, and they, <laughs> they have all of the same brain areas that we do, just not as elaborate. Uh, and so... I think it's not, it's maybe a hard question with very distant animals from humans, but I think like given how homologous their brain, their nervous system is to ours, that it would be very strange if they weren't sentient. Yeah. And how does the impact, tractability and neglectedness criteria apply to rodent welfare? Uh, I think that as far as comparing to like other EA interventions, it's not uh, high in impact uh, because so I estimated the number of urban rodents that would be affected by the kinds of policies I was writing about in um, my recent papers uh, to be something like 55 million, uh, which is not that much compared to broiler chickens, which are like in the billions each year, you know, uh, legislation affecting them or like uh, uh, corporate campaigns that affect them, like can affect a lot more individuals. Uh, but the reason that we were interested in rodent welfare was because it's sort of it's not only for the direct impact on the rodents today if any one of these policies to reduce the use of rodenticides were to be implemented but it's also the way that this is my theory of change it's a little bit idiosyncratic but just the way that it perhaps opens people up to thinking differently about our relationship to wild animals so uh rats that live commensally with humans are not uh Rats that live, what, where was I going with that? <laughs> um, yeah, rats that live commensally with humans are not what a lot of people would consider like wild animals. They're they're human associated, they're not. But um, so there's perhaps more of a sense of having a duty toward them. Like we definitely, we do things to affect their welfare, uh, like intentionally killing them. We do things to uh, invite them to live with us, like have trash out. Uh, so taking a, a population where humans have more of a sense of moral responsibility than perhaps nature uh, and opening their minds to there's maybe another way to handle this. It, yes, it's true. I, I don't think that we can just ignore the problem of pest rodents like they do cause disease and uh, they can really make human <laughs> mental health very bad. Uh, so I don't think it's something that should just be ignored. And when the only option is to kill, I, I think like you know, you, you might have to do that, but the, but what's the truth here is like, we're expanding the set of options so that you don't have to kill. And we'd like to, that mentality to carry forward to all wild animals. Yeah. So rodenticides are inhumane because they are anticoagulants that lead to internal bleeding and all sorts of harm. So I was wondering if there were any um, anthropocentric arguments for why we should phase out the usage of rodenticides that you think are confused, uh, convincing. Perhaps it's them being like ineffective or them leading to bioaccumulation that could harm megafauna. Are there like any others as well? Yeah. So there's a uh... There's anticoagulant rodenticides, which were the focus of my paper. So there's also like acute rodenticides, they're called, that act more immediately and act in a number of ways. And already like the worst acute rodenticides have pretty limited usage. Like strychnine, you've probably heard of, is just like a poison that people use to kill each other. Like that uh, used to be used as 
rodenticide. And I think there's one legitimate use that's still legal in the U.S. Um, but uh, yeah, there's plenty of human safety reasons to be concerned about the use of rodenticides. I mean, children, I actually ate rat poison as a child. <laughs> um, I just found it looked like candy. It looked like it looked like a candy my grandmother had been giving us. And then I found one on the floor of her garage and I just thought it was candy. Unfortunately, I told somebody that I ate it um, and they like got me, uh, you know, vomit inducing medication. Um, but like this happens like pretty frequently. I think it like it was estimated in the 2010s that um, uh, 10,000 children a year go to the hospital because in the U.S. alone because of exposure to or possible exposure to rodenticides. So that's very serious. Uh, also pets, uh, or it's a very big concern because even though the, these poisons are supposed to go in boxes, bait boxes that are supposed to select only rats or only mice to go into them, they, pets can still get into them. And when pets eat them, uh, actually, if they eat the anticoagulants, there is a, uh, a, a, an antidote, vitamin K. Uh, so the anticoagulants work by stopping the production of vitamin K. And then if you provide vitamin K, then that reverses the symptoms. But uh, with the other kinds of rodenticides, the acute rodenticides, there, there isn't uh, an antidote, which is so if a pet eats um, vitamin D, for instance, is the uh, what a lot of anticoagulants uh, had been replaced with. So in decon products, for instance, like all decon products went from being like a mix of rodenticides to being uh, vitamin K, sorry, <laughs> vitamin D. Uh, and that's uh, very scary. All they can do is just aggressively hydrate pets or, or children uh, who overdose on one of those. So it's not a complete, even though I think for various reasons discussed in the report that anticoagulant rodenticides are just because they're the widest used and they're probably the cruelest because of just how long the experience is. It takes like five to seven days for a uh, rodent to die after ingesting a fatal dose. Uh, that that's, I think, rightly the target of our efforts. Uh, there are some, there's really no like excellent poison <laughs> that does that, you know, kills painlessly and only kills target animals. Like there's a lot of risk with using poisons at all. So yeah, um, sanitation and sealing food sources away from rodents uh, is like the most humane method of solving the problem. Uh, but do you think that improved sanitation is unlikely for big cities? Uh, I think that improved sanitation is probably most likely for like medium sized municipalities uh, because the yeah, with very large cities like New York, there's so many demands on like what the New York sanitation system is doing and why there's a lot of like space demands. There's a lot of, uh, you know, where do they keep things? What routes do they take? Uh, where does the trash go in New York? Like that's all like highly constrained and they're already trying to reduce the trash. Like it's, it's hard to just say like, oh, well, did you realize that rodents eat trash too? Like that's... Um, so it might not be like the best for very big congested cities, but um, I think a lot of like slightly smaller municipalities uh, that there might be the will to, because a lot of people don't realize that uh, sanitation reform is part of how you reduce rodent populations. And so I believe that if there were like an information campaign based on that, that a lot of municipalities do have some wiggle room. And maybe if the public is more willing to do things like separate trash or lock certain trash containers, that they might be more willing if they know this about rodents and that might be possible to implement in cities where they're not like already at capacity with their sanitation system. Yeah, and how might this look for like developing nations um, where sanitation is already like difficult um, to get because even though there might be like demand for it, it's just, you know, impossible to seal away uh, most of these food sources. Yeah, that's tougher. I mean, that seems all similarly to large cities in uh, like the US that, I mean, everybody sort of already knows like we want more infrastructure, we want, uh, it might just be a matter of, yeah, of development. Yeah, that makes sense. And another humane practice was, um, I think, uh, birth control for rodents. So how do we get cities to actually implement some of these more humane practices as opposed to using uh, rodenticides? I think that birth control, there there are rodent birth controls, first of all, which is like pretty cool. Uh, most people don't know that and it seems pretty sci-fi. So there are like rodent birth control products that already exist and they're already um, used in a commercial setting. There, not, there are problems with them. So Contrapest is the main one uh, in the US. It's got a couple of issues. It's really just like a first generation product. 
correct and it just uh, needs to be refined. Uh, and so I, the issues are, are not huge. It's mainly just expensive. Uh, and so costs need to come down. And then there's like some things about implementation, like it was originally made as a liquid and there were some problems with that. Like it freezes, it, it uh, goes moldy, things like that. Um, so, but there are the, the, the inventors of ContraPest are working on a new formula that is solid and uh, which they also think will be cheaper. Uh, it hasn't gone through like the approvals by the EPA yet, but um, they believe it's going to be a lot cheaper. So I think the way forward is, is developing just better birth control products that like meet the needs more and are more cost competitive with poisons. So that, I mean, the ideal thing would be that, you know, instead of having, instead of requiring people to go through these like perfect hygiene practices, all of that stuff is and like rodent proofing where, you know, you fill all the holes in people's houses. It's very difficult. It's not as easy to like mechanize and make rote like applying poison is. Uh, so birth control, if it could be made to just be swapped out with poison, to just be a solid bait that you can apply in a bait station, uh, then that would be ideal. Uh, so we're not quite there, but um, in some very like sensitive settings, it might be already cost effective to use contrapest just because it's it's safe, like places where you really can't have poison. Um, and uh, some people might already voluntarily just prefer to use contrapest and prefer to pay the costs. So I, you know, we're thinking that probably like private uh, customers will be part of moving that forward. As far as like getting cities to adopt it, it's a lot of cities have trialed it uh, and were interested in seeing how it worked. I think it just ended up being too expensive for a lot of them. And that we'll probably see that change just as the product is developed and the successors to the product are developed. Yeah, and are there any other players apart from ContraPest? And what do you think maybe having more players might do in terms of innovation and cost? It would be really awesome if there were players besides. Uh, so Synestec is the company that makes ContraPest. Loretta Meyer and Cheryl Dyer are the people who invented ContraPest and they're working on this second product separate from Synestec. There's also uh, immunocontraceptive vaccines are another form of birth control. So it's, this is a form of birth control where you uh, the animal like either gets an injection or they eat a bait that makes them like allergic to part of their own reproductive system. And it's harmless. Like <laughs> um, it just makes it so that they don't, um, is uh, aimed at females. It makes it so that you can't like uh, have an egg that gets fertilized. And so those are pretty cool. They're currently uh, not far developed. So most, most of them are injectable vaccines and that's very difficult for like a pest population. So that's that's fine for like wild horses is like one use of these vaccines because, you know, people can keep track of the wild horses. They like blow a little blow dart of the vaccine to the wild horse. They only need it like once a, once a year, but that's like not at all um, tractable for rodents, especially like you don't know where they are. You know, it's hard to, the, the needle delivery doesn't work for them, but they, um, there is right now uh, an agency in the UK is testing uh, oral baits for gray squirrels, which are invasive in the UK. Um, and if that works, uh, that might, there's, they've already done lab tests in, in rats as well. If that works, that, that might be another player. And are regulatory agencies like the FDA and EPA worried about bioaccumulation of birth control? Um, like if they are, then isn't the alternative, the bioaccumulation of rodenticides, which is much worse, um, when, you know, it gets concentrated up the food chain. Yes, this is something that the EPA is worried about. So ContraPest, one of the issues with uh, ContraPest is that its strategy was to go through the same process as rodenticides to be approved by the EPA. And they, so it, they met incredibly strict standards about um, what they could say was no bioaccumulation. So like the dose was set by this, like it's a dose that in an average rat body is completely consumed in 15 minutes. So it will never bioaccumulate. So in order to make the promise that ContraPest wouldn't bioaccumulate, they might have um, sacrificed other things about maybe the ideal dose. Um, I think that bioaccumulation of the active ingredients in contrapest is probably not so bad because it would just like, you need multiple doses of, of contrapest in order to have your fertility affected. And even then it's only temporary. It's only like a couple of months. Um, so it would be a low dose that, that pass on to the next trophic level. And that would be an even less like effective dose at ver minimizing fertility in that like higher trophic level. So I am not 
that concerned about it. Um, the EPA was very concerned about it. Um, and Contrapest wanted, uh, the company wanted to be able to say that it didn't bioaccumulate. Uh, especially because as you point out, like rightly, like the big issue with anticoagulant rid ridded sides, um, as far as like most activists are concerned, is that it bioaccumulates in the protons, uh, the, the uh, predators of rodents. So, uh, and that, it really does linger in them and that can accumulate to a very high level because rodents can also eat especially of the second generation anticoagulants, they can eat many times a lethal dose before they die. So they can be carrying around a huge amount and that is then passed up the food chain and its half-life is like at least a year. I mean, it takes a very long, depending on like the particular substance, there's meant to eat many um, particular uh, chemicals that are anticoagulant rodenticides. But uh, yeah, so that <laughs> can take a very long time to, to go away. And then it can get further concentrated um, if, you know, this is an animal that the predator in turn has predators. Uh, yeah. So compared to what it's replacing, it's also just like not even close to the, the harms. Yeah. So I had another reason in mind, and this is coming purely from like an animal welfare perspective, but even if it does lead to less fertility of other wild animals, um, isn't conservationism bad because it just leads to like more wild animal suffering? So maybe potentially, even if this could lead to like, I don't know, less births of predators, might that just be like better off for like animal welfare in general? Well, so yeah, a lot of, we took it as for granted in like these papers about rodenticides that like other, so like a lot of our goals here are not set by like what would be ideal for wild animal welfare perhaps, but like what other humans will allow, like they don't want rats, like it's not, so like sometimes people who are like more from the EA wild animal welfare side would like be like, well, what if rats are happy and it's like good to have rats? And I'm like, well, that's not really the question. Like if somebody is going to get, get rid, rid of these rats and like we're trying to like figure out a way to do this more humanely. Um, and then similarly with like the charismatic uh, fauna that prey on rodents or that are affected by uh, the bioaccumulation, like those are some of humanity's favorite animals, you know? And so like a lot of the existing attention to this issue is because of the, I think most of the existing attention to the anticoagulant rodenticide issue is because of uh, secondary ingestion by birds that people like, people love birds of prey. <laughs> um, so yeah, we never considered it like, uh, like viable to consider not preserving uh, those species. They do eat a lot of rats. I mean, one thing that was clear from <laughs> from the research on on secondary ingestion is that they can eat like such a high number of rats, which is just like a general reminder about predation. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess we considered that kind of thinking like out of the scope, and um, that's probably not. I, I don't. That's not part of my theory of change for how people come to like widen their moral circle to think about wild animal welfare in that way. Like, I think it's gonna come with like slow introductions and especially stuff that's not like directly challenging to things that we really value about nature. Yeah, um, and what does your timeline look like for like more rodent birth control? Are you a pessimist or an optimist? What would your like ideal world look like? Well, there are like a couple promising products uh, right now. Well, there's so there's three that I talked about. There's Contrapest, which you know will surely like have imp uh, improvements and updates. Uh, there's Loretta Meyer and Cheryl Dyer's new product uh, that they're working on, and then there's the immunocontraceptive baits. Those are all pretty promising, and this is, I mean, there are other applications of wild animal birth control which are like which are very impressive, but this would be like the largest scale thing that anybody is attempting. So I'm, I'm pretty positive about that for uh, moving forward animal birth control in general. Uh, and what are, so if I had to give like an estimate, um, these, the immunocontraceptive baits are in a trial for an invasive species in the UK and they're like allowed to do stuff that hasn't like passed all approvals for, you know, um, for situations like that. So I don't know how far like that particular project is going to go, but if they are, if their oral bait formation works, like that's a lot of work that's been done converting that from a, an injectable to uh, an oral bait. And I, I bet somebody will pick that up, uh, for commercial purposes, if it works, uh, which it, it seems to be, uh, so that's, 
So I'm pretty, I'm pretty optimistic. I know that uh, Loretta Meyer is pushing her product forward and they've had trials in the Galapagos already. Um, they're looking especially to, this is an interesting like side note, a big thing with uh, the use of rodenticides is that actually a lot of um, conservationists are attached to using rodenticides for getting rid of invasive rodents from islands that had like a pristine endemic ecosystem. And they regret having used them because they're like, they have a lot of collateral damage. But basically what they do is like, they try to like remove any animals that are like super sensitive uh, and keep them in captivity for however long it takes. And it can take like four years. And then they like bomb the place with rodenticides and wait for all the rats to to die and like carry off their bodies and like wait for it to like leave the soil. And, um, and then they bring back, you know, the animals that they had in captivity and even given all that destruction, it still does work to like preserve some of the, the biodiversity and like bring back more of the original ecosystem. So um, there are many conservation programs that are dedicated to this. And so they are actually, even though they would otherwise, I, you know, Audubon Society of California, for instance, was not supportive of the rodenticide ban, the anticoagulant ban in California because, not initially anyway, um, because they were concerned that they wouldn't be able to do this anymore. Um, so Loretta has been focused on with her solid bait, like what she wants is something that could replace rodenticides for that purpose. So that like, and that, I think that that would be very helpful to bring conservationists and, and wild animal welfare people together, uh, and just be able to focus on, you know, have both of our like separate goals, but like, mo you know, almost everybody would prefer a humane way to do it. Um, so I'm confident about that because Loretta's already, you know, trialing it in the, the arena that she was like most keen on seeing it in. And I think that that is an important arena. Uh, and then if it gets started, if people start using it there, that it'll probably be used in commercial conflicts. Yeah, I wanna now move um, back to the less humane methods um, that aren't necessarily rodenticides, but um, rodent traps. So how do we decide if um, one intervention, so let's say a bolt trap is less painful than another intervention, like a glue trap? Do we look at like the, de the degree to which the rodent shows aversion or the length of time it takes for death or just inferences we make about how this might affect humans and then we like decide? Yeah, I looked at a number of things. So for for poisons, I looked at a lot of human cases of overdose on those poisons. Um, and that informed a lot of my idea of what the pain level was, like both what like doctors said about that case and uh, what people reported if they took a sublethal dose. Um, so that was probably the biggest source uh, for that. It's There's a lot of uncertainty about like what they're actually feeling on that basis and with uh yeah so with glue traps like off it like we would think about when assessing that like okay like what are they going through how long are they like stuck how long are they sort of like pulling and tearing their own flesh like how would that feel for a human like how is that evaluated on like you know dollies or things like, like it was a fairly holistic uh estimate in those papers it would certainly be possible to do a more uh, principled estimate. Um, and there's not a lot on, um, as you mentioned, like there's not a lot of studies about like willingness to pay of the rodents themselves to get out of a situation. Um, and it would be like a pretty devious study to run, but it might like give us a lot of information. But it, so far as I, I know, there's not that much uh, out there. Like that's not really an interest of people who like develop these poisons is like exactly how much it's hurting the rat. But um yeah, we could, we might be surprised. Um, like, uh, there's also this very uh, intrinsic difficulty in like putting duration against intensity. Like, there might not be a principled answer for like how bad an experience is. You know, like if it differs in duration and intensity, like uh, it would be ideal to get it down to like one number that described that. But um, yeah, so that a lot of it is uh, a healthy dose of guesswork and inference to just how much does it hurt humans to go through a similar thing? Yeah, I want to now chat about people's attitudes towards rodents and um, what we can do. So in a Rethink Priorities report, um, I think digital campaigns were shown to have potentially high impact. So were these um, digital campaigns about getting people to, um, you know, uh, care more about rodent um, suffering or was it to just get them to like adopt more like humane practices or engage in sanitation and stuff like that? 
Uh, we mainly uh, are, uh, there were a couple of reasons that we uh, thought that digital campaigns would work well. One was that they were like pretty cheap for a lot of exposure. Another was that they were pretty neglected. Like even the orgs that work on specifically getting bands of anticoagulant uh, rodenticides because they care about uh, the animals that prey on rodents, uh, they had often done digital advertising, but it had been like very haphazard. And so, and they had had success like with their digital advertising that they did do in a, in like a, you know, like less than ideal way. And so it seemed that probably there was a lot of opportunity. Um, we did, this is an unpublished or this will be rodenticides part four, you know, um, when it goes up, but we did message testing and focus groups. And we did a lot of surveys on different messages, which included a mix of, you know, humane concern versus like more, you know, selfish concern, like, hey, wouldn't you rather have less rats for like less money or something? Like, <laughs> wouldn't you rather like do it the right way, like not expose children to poison? Like it was a, we tried a number of, of things and uh, we, yeah, how do I summarize those responses without giving away unpublished stuff? Um, yeah, I think a variety of things would work. Also PETA has tried, uh, a dumb, they've done, they don't do that much on on rodents or like or commensal rodents but they uh they like took out an attack ad on jared kushner for being a bad landlord and like po using rat poison against his uh <laughs> on his uh properties and like things like that and um they told me that they had like various reasons to believe that those were like modestly successful like among their ads you know the kind of ad that they would run yeah this all has been really insightful stuff on um rodents and what we should do. But I wanted to ask a more general question. So what should someone um, who is considering wanting to work on rodent welfare do? Uh, specifically rodent welfare, where there are a lot of jobs. So like you may have heard um, this was, or this was big news in the US anyway, that like New York City appointed a rat czar. Um, so like there are jobs like that, you know, that if they were filled by somebody, you know, who cares about rodent welfare, like could go very differently. Um, you could work on, so animal birth control is like a very, very neglected, like understudied field. Uh, I think there's just tons of potential there. Uh, so if somebody wanting to like follow an academic route, that would be one place to go. Um, someone else, okay, wanting to work on rodent welfare. There is a lot of existing, as I said, in the US anyway, there's a lot of like in the in Canada, like there's a lot of concern about the secondary ingestion of anticoagulant rodenticides, but there's very little as far as um, orgs that focus on humaneness toward the rodents themselves. And I think, while I mean, maybe there's a reason, like maybe that's not a super successful strategy. I think that it mostly hasn't been tried or orgs that have existing reputations like in other things, or they just do a diverse portfolio, like don't really want to take that on. Um, but if you're really motivated, uh, I think there could be, there's a big wide open field for somebody to focus on humaneness. Yeah, um, so now on to questions uh, about wild animal welfare. So my first question is, um, should we intervene in the wild if we don't know if like predation is more painful than disease? So like, if I could give you an example, if let's say there is a campaign to like um, get rid of plastic in oceans. Um, should we still support stuff like that if we don't know whether a turtle dying due to plastic is more painful than it being predated upon? I think there's so many reasons not to, well, okay, that's that's an interesting question because I think, so I, I and everybody else draws a big distinction between like human caused harms and anthropogenic harms which are also human caused harms, sorry, and non-anthropogenic caused harms. Um, so uh, like, I think that it's a lot more tractable for a bajillion reasons to focus on just reversing human caused harms. Uh, one reason is that generally like other people accept that that's something we should do. They think that like you did something wrong and changed nature and you should change it back. Um, so if you're harming animals with a human cause thing, I think that's like way more tractable to start. But I also am, think that the reason to focus on those is that we know what will happen. Like there might be some changes to the ecosystem or some unexpected ways in which the ecosystem has adapted and like to this harm that was incorporated for a while. But it's a lot easier to undo, to just take stuff out that had been put in recently than to like try to mess with the whole dynamics of the ecosystem. So I feel like we don't, 
know enough. Not that it's impossible. Like there are some like fairly good bets, but I just think in general, like to do the scale of changes that, you know, you would have to do to like make a dent in suffering, like as a whole, like, I think you want to keep it to system to actions that you really understand what will happen and that we're just not there. Like, and we maybe will be, I mean, with like, if improvements and, uh, you know, AI go be go well, like we might have all the information we need to figure out how to make changes. And then it'll just be a matter of like our values or like making sure we're making the right changes. But as you point out, like we're not, sometimes even if you get what you want, that might not be what you really want. It turns out there's just many, many, we need the ability to simulate a lot <laughs> of uh, worlds like in, in, in depth, I think before we actually attempt things that, especially things that might not be reversible on nature. Yeah, so this is something that like stumped me personally, but um, what are the ethics of killing carnivorous animals in the wild to prevent suffering occurring to herbivores um, and like reinventing the ecosystem in that manner? I mean, they would be huge. Uh, <laughs> it depends on how much you care about species identity, which I think, you know, people who are like into WA and like taken to it the way it is, like, are not you know they they're much more concerned about just the experience of the animal like through whatever vessel they're in but um but you know a lot of people working in wad don't place zero value on biodiversity uh and depending on like what your persuasion is within uh within caring about wild animal welfare like the ability to do natural behaviors and things like it's like a big part of fulfillment um the whether or not you have like the right to to kill animals uh even if it's like euthanasia you think uh is all pretty controversial i have to say i was like much more in fate i was much more of like a negative utilitarian before i started working on what like i thought like well, I don't want to cause suffering with any of these actions. And I think it would be very hard to like, to go into nature and kill animals without like causing a lot of suffering. Um, but, you know, if, if I could just, you know, snap my fingers and the world was rewritten where there were no predators, like that would be better. But um, since starting working on why, like I became like much more conservative about like making changes at all. Um, and like the, just the scale. Uh, um, I don't think that means that we can abdicate our responsibility. Like there's nobody else who's going to do something about just like whatever, like horrible equilibrium, like nature gets itself into. Um, but I do, it did make me think like, whoa, there's just so much we don't know. There's so many ways that these kind of interventions can go wrong. Like I do see that as being like, well, well in the future, unless there's, you know, the te our technological ability to evaluate these things like really picks up soon. Yeah, and often it's also hard to empathize with wild fish or insects, but from an evolutionary point of view, um, do you think it's highly likely that they are just as sentient um, or as some of the other animals people care a lot about? This is so, the, so maybe you've been following the Moral Way Project from Rethink Priorities, but I used to think like, well, of course they're not like as, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's, you know, you can think of, based on like the hard problem of consciousness, like it might be that like all of the features of our experience are just completely orthogonal to being sentient. Um, and that seemed possible, but I have an evolutionary background and I just kind of, I, it's hard for me not to have sort of functionalist assumptions about like, there, it, it's probably for something. I mean, it's this complex state, you know, um, it's probably being justified by some kind of returns, you know, in fitness. Um, so, I still assumed, I guess, roughly by body size, I had this like heuristic in my head about like the level of sentience dropping off. But based on the Moral Weight Project, I mean, they really <laughs> went in there in a very principled way and looked at like indicators of sentience across all of these taxa and they found it just really doesn't vary that much. And that surprises me. And I spent a brief time at Rethink Priorities looking looking into black soldier fly larva sentience. And I have to admit, like everything I looked into, I just thought like, whoa, I just don't see, other than the fact that it's like a lot smaller than me, like I don't see much reason to justify thinking that its sentience is any different than mine. I mean, like if I didn't have access to my own sentience, um, 
Yeah. So I really, I, I'm like newly, especially confused about this. I I'm open to, I I'm open to the possibility of like a lot more equal sentience. It does really throw our calculations into chaos if you're like very, very committed to utilitarianism, but um, yeah, this is just an area of like high uncertainty for me. I recommend the moral weight project. <laughs> yeah. And I think another thing that was, um, something that kind of, um, confused me is do like, if let's say there's more like, like, uh, so you're talking about black soldier fly larvae. Um, so if we're doing insect farming, that's like a huge number of insects, right? It's like maybe possibly trillions. Yes. It's uh, like trillions a year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that means that they all have individual experiences of pain. Um, so is having a very large number of like individual experiences of pain much worse than having some, like a smaller number of animals, but that could be larger, um, worse? Like, I don't really know. There's like, is, is it worse when they're more like when there's a greater number feeling pain or is just pain, can pain be more concentrated among like a smaller number of animals? Yeah, I, this is, so these are called aggregation problems. Uh, and uh, it's, I mean, nobody has a great answer to this. It kind of just comes down to people's like dogmas that they assert, you know, <laughs> uh, there's the big like question everybody has and we kind of just wish that we could find like oh is there a threshold we're below which the below this size it like doesn't matter it doesn't add you know um but i mean you could call one way of looking at wild animal welfare as a field is like just a series of never-ending aggregation problems like uh even things that seem simple like diet change like oh don't eat factory farmed animals like well if you don't then what happens to the land that they were being raised on like it goes back to wild and like are animals like suffering on that land or not you know and so even any action kind of like ripples out into just like how many like you know bajillions of very small uh lives you're affecting uh I find these really maddening I think like I don't know part of me just thinks like there is no way that we are this stuck like you know that we can't move forward somehow um or like pick a scale and like make some progress there and then like widen um but it's it's genuinely very compelling I think probably the only way we're going to like make any headway in these problems is to pick kind of our arbitrary boundaries and just like try to make some intellectual progress there and then like maybe be able to expand it like for instance I'm still supportive of not eating factory farm animals um I think like there is like justification for treating those things as sort of separate just because because the theory of change is different like uh you know, getting people to care about factory farmed animals, like leads to many good outcomes for animals, hopefully, you know, like, I personally think that it like removes um, in barriers of indifference uh, toward animals, if you're not complicit in harming them. Um, and so even if the, the direct consequence, like there, it could lead directly to like, you know, more insects living on that land and like not liking life. That's also an assumption. I don't know that insects don't <laughs> like their lives, but um, um the like indirect influence of the indirect impact of that I expect to be better for animals uh even though this does introduce like a lot of uncertainty to that so um yeah with aggregation problems just at like your original question about insects versus um like larger animals we do have this bias like we all like care more you know about the larger animals and we all I mean just like the repugnant conclusion, right? Like we don't want to live in world Z, but like the point is that there are a lot more people there and their lives are worth living, you know? And so like, you have to consult all of that. Um, pretty much a lot of uh, assumptions in wild animal welfare, like with birth control are sort of interestingly, like a little bit average utilitarian sounding, like they um, want better at welfare for, um, for a smaller number basically and i think it makes sense like i think it's just not even a question like when humans are demanding a smaller population of rodents like then oh okay like we can make a smaller population and each individual could be better off but it is like a much the theoretical issue of like what would be the ideal population you know of all animals <laughs> like is uh still leaves open that possibility that like very foreign states of you know, very small amounts of welfare, like aggregated, like is overweighs or like of uh weighs more than the kinds of welfare that we're used to thinking about. And I do think that's like 
a new frontier for now I, it just seems like taste and your like philosophical inclinations are what decides that question yeah um i think you um talked about um ai uh being used in wild animal welfare so i know that ai has like a huge um potential to do a lot of harm in farm animal welfare um but do you think mm -hmm. um that ai could also do like really bad things in wild animal welfare as well well, with farm animal welfare, there's like much more of a motive to do something bad, uh, you know, just for profit to justify um, conditions uh, that maybe like from here we're like, this looks terrible. But if you like trusted an AI and it said, no, it turns out they're fine, you know, like, um, like there's a reason to do that, like for profit in farm animal welfare for wild animal welfare. Um, yeah, it's, it's less obvious to me, like what direction that would go in, like who would be running nature in what way like I feel like once we have technologies like AI that could really give us insight into like the states and of other of like for really foreign animals and could tell us a lot about like predict really precisely what ecosystem dynamics will be that like resource competition probably won't be like as big of a problem I don't know <laughs> maybe it will maybe it'll be more of a problem but like um I guess it would just depend on like, yeah, what's the motive for um, for abusing the AI? I mean, I could definitely see people even just like within wild animal welfare, like having just different beliefs and like wanting to manipulate the AI to, um, to come to those conclusions. Uh, yeah, so it could be quite dangerous. I mean, again, it's, it's just a very like, the, the scale of rewriting that like, wild animal welfare is driving towards is pretty scary and it should be done very carefully and like that's actually like even bad actors taking it over is would be an issue uh also just I don't know if the AI like got it wrong <laughs> you know like that would be or like had the wrong idea about like what sentience is because like we don't in and and there's like a strong argument that in principle we never could so yeah, so this was incredibly insightful stuff on wild animal welfare, and there's just so many open questions, um, and we don't know if we'll ever be able to, like, find answers to that. Um, but I wanted to move on to something else, which is um, more personal questions. So what got you passionate about animal welfare? I I think it was from the time I realized what meat was. I, it was, like, around five. My mom says it, it helped that my teacher was vegetarian, which I don't remember, but I <laughs> probably, like... I did have, a, I do remember like having a sense of like, oh, you, there's an option to just not do this. Like one, like, oh my God, this is horrible. Like what, like what I've just discovered. And then like two, like you can just not, you can just not participate. Um, so yeah, that was like the main way I contributed to animal welfare for a long time. And it was because of being like challenged all the time about my diet. And like, especially when I became vegan when I was a teenager, that like I had to think very hard. I So when I first started, I was just like, you shouldn't kill animals. And I defend that. I think I had the right reaction to, you know, finding out the animals are killed, but it is rather simplistic. And uh, then I, I became more of like a conscious utilitarian or like caring about the suffering of the animals during their lives because I, you know, had to think a lot about like, what's really bad about this situation? Like, could there be a situation where you have other animals, you know, for just to use and consume, but it's okay. And I actually did come to the conclusion that like, yeah, if it didn't bother them, then that would be fine. But I think that, you know, farmed animals are bothered. Um, and then wild animal welfare, I had a pretty bad reaction to at first, like <laughs> a lot of people do. <laughs> like uh, a friend of mine in college, like wanted me to read uh, Brian Tomasic. And I... I never was like, oh, this is false, but I was just, it was just so upsetting just because, well, it really, it messes with like myths about nature, which are very important to like all human societies. Uh, I had always been someone who really liked the idea of there being like a natural rhythm or something that you could tap into. Um, but yeah, the more that I, like, it just brainwormed me and like the more that I thought about it, the more that I thought like, yeah, this is, um, this is important. I'm still, I'm not highly interventionist still. Um, and in fact, one reason I started working on it professionally at Rethink Priorities was because I thought that it was important for there to be more people like me who were like, thought had more 
a sense of possibility, like maybe animals aren't miserable all the time. Like maybe happiness is like worth, you know, more. A lot of the people in the field, it was very, the people in the field at the time were like very close to Brian, uh, you know, and like had that same like weighting of happiness and suffering. And Brian himself says that this is totally a matter of subjective belief, you know, like how you weight those things. Like it might seem obvious to to other people that like happiness is worth like even, you know, uh, an eternity of suffering, <laughs> like, you know, just one moment of like true happiness. It was, and Brian's kind of the opposite. Like, you know, if you have like really in intense suffering, it, there's like nothing that can really make up for that. Um, and I'm more in the middle. I'm like very sympathetic to the negative side. I've been depressed, you know, like I have had a lot of, I've had Another thing that concerns me about that whole issue is that like when I'm depressed, it seems really obvious that like, you know, no amount of happiness is worth like bad suffering. And then when I feel better, I'm sort of like to the stars, humanity, like, you know, we can, uh, what all of these vistas of opportunity. So I've seen how that aspect of um, approaching wild animal welfare uh, is just varies based a lot on mood and on the, your like predilections. So I thought it was important for people with different with an understanding of that and maybe like more of a leading toward the positive side to be involved in wild animal welfare um so that was even though I always like was a little like oh I don't know like this seems like <laughs> uh pretty crazy like I was intrigued by it and I kind of wanted to like put my own stamp on it and like see if there you know what I could contribute that maybe was missing for like the reasons that I had seen uh that the field was pretty weighted to one side yeah, and I think I could definitely attest to like thinking um, that the wild was just this idyllic place for animals. I think a lot of the, I don't know, the BBC Earth documentaries kind of got me to think that way um, until I like found out that, you know, it is possible for animals in the wild to suffer a lot. I also um, am a bit unsure about the whole, you know, is it net positive, net negative, and how to equate both of those things together. Um, so I think I am like, I have the same position as you on this Um on this issue as well. Um, so my next question is, what does um, a day in the life look like for you? Well, I'm a remote researcher, so <laughs> it's getting up and getting on my computer basically. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so like right now I'm working on a report um, for a foundation about the field. And so I've been doing a lot of interviews with different like stakeholders and uh, and like thinking a lot about like different people's theories of change and uh, what, how compatible they are and sort of how the, the space works together. So I've been doing sort of like a sociology of WA recently. Um, we tried at first uh, earlier in my, um, in my employment, everything uh, to look a lot more at direct interventions, but it's pretty, there, there's really no principled way to find it was really worth looking, you know, it was possible that there would be a lot of like high value interventions that, you know, you just had to like be a desk researcher and like sort of like think about it a little and like we would recommend those and then somebody would like develop them. But that has not been how it's worked out, largely just because of how, because of these like ripple effects, you know, aggregation issues that uh, I talked about. It just seems like it's really hard to get a read on like whether many things would be robustly positive at all. Um, so and of course, to begin in a controversial field, we're like looking for stuff that's very uncontroversial and robustly positive to be pursuing. Um, so yeah, occasionally I'll have an idea for something like that, like a more direct intervention and we like talk about it, but, um, and, you know, consider it. But um, mostly what we do now is pretty like zoomed out, um, targeted stuff, like, targeted more for indirect effects on like people's openness to wild animal welfare. Uh, and that kind of goes with like the rest of the field, the way the rest of the field is, is um, like Wild Animal Initiative, the biggest organization uh, devoted to wild animal welfare is uh, dedicated to academic field building. And a lot of other people in the space too are just sort of working on supporting that mission. Um, just hoping that like when we have more infrastructure, like we'll have a lot of the things we need. We'll have like the prestige to be able to, you know, like propose things and not be like <laughs> laughed off the stage. Uh, we'll have uh, the empirical information to like, we'll have the ability to learn about these effects that we're so concerned about, you know, and like actually assess whether we could do something. 
we'll have just more people working on it. So if like there are opportunities, I have no doubt that there are opportunities out there where we could interfere in nature and it would just be like a small sort of like isolated part of the graph and it just wouldn't affect <laughs> that much else. Um, but like, we're going to need a lot of like people thinking this way on the lookout for interventions in order to find those, like, they're just, they're not as thick on the ground, these opportunities, like, as we might've thought. Um, yeah. So, so to summarize that, yeah. So there's, it's, there's a lot of field building is the emphasis right now in like my current, uh, the project that's taking up all my time is, a, a field building ish project about how to direct grants, uh, toward proper field building. Yeah, and what advice do you have for someone who wants to research wild animal suffering as a welfare biologist? Ooh, well, they should maybe talk to Wild Animal Initiative because they can be very helpful. Uh, they're looking to help people early career. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, I My background is evolutionary biology and it's pretty theoretical. And I was hoping that I would be able to engage that more, but it just doesn't seem like I don't think that that's where, like, if you want to work on in, like, the EA field of law, like, that's not sort of where things are. Uh, if you want to just be an evolutionary biologist who's focused on wild animal welfare topics, like, then totally. Like, if you want to be any kind of uh, biologist, but with a welfare lens, like, that is a very live option right now, <laughs> um, because there's not much of a, like, more focused wild animal welfare thing for you to do. You can maybe take a look at the... Uh, the grants that Wild Animal Initiative has uh, regranted, uh, the kinds of projects that they're looking at. So these are like, you could, if you were wanting to go into work on a wild animal welfare, you could do things that were more directly targeted on welfare. But like, the, just to give an example of like ways to take like research that people were already doing that had implications for welfare and like making it more focused on welfare, like the kinds of um, just how like broad that can be. Um, I should probably think harder about this. I haven't really thought about like young people. I think mostly about mid-career people. <laughs> um, I think there's also a lot of topics that we don't talk about a lot in wild animal welfare, like for lab research, that would be really useful just to know more about animal cognition uh, and like the kind of cognition that we care about. It's like there is a field of animal cognition, but it's not aim so much at like their welfare. Uh, and so animal welfare, wild animal welfare science is not really that similar to animal welfare science, which is, would be focused on this kind of stuff. It's a lot more ecological evolutionary. Um, and somebody working on doing sort of the animal welfare version of, of wild animal welfare science would be great just to like give us more of an idea of like what actually like what do these animals like? What do, uh, we could get some idea about preferences and then like, yeah, other things like correlates of sentience and their experience, I think would be very valuable. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And um, I wanted to ask what animal welfare charities do you donate to and how should one go about deciding that? You know, I used, for many years, I donated to Mercy for Animals just because I had volunteered for them before and I just kind of felt like I knew them. Um, and they were like a top give well charity uh, at the time. Now I donate to like, I split my uh, donations between the Animal Welfare Fund and the, e, the it's not the Future Fund. Oh my gosh. Anyway, but the, the Give Well Fund that uh, covers uh, long-term future and, uh, and animal. Uh, and I just let them decide <laughs> that for me. If uh, if you want to donate to wild animal welfare stuff, ACE actually is made wild animal welfare one of their, ACE being Animal Charity Evaluators, uh, the charity evaluator for EA Animal Charities has made wild animals like one of their priorities on the basis of neglectedness, I believe. And so they will have uh, increasingly more content on who to donate to for wild animals. Um, I think it's a little bit hard to pick winners on the wild animal stuff like why is the biggest one um if you care about specific things like if you want there to be more messaging about wild animal welfare then animal ethics is probably the one um there's yeah what else would i recommend
according to like most of the fields theory of change right now, like making it possible for there to be more like academic and early career and mid career scholarships and stuff for for wild animal welfare is good. So it would be cool if you could donate in a way that was earmarked to that. But I actually don't think that there is currently. Um, if you donate to Wild Animal Initiative, it's possible your money will go to that. Um, you might also, I mean, it's such a small field. If you have money to donate, you might also want to like do something kind of creative, like support somebody who's trying to work in the field. Uh, like just try to like remove barriers for them or like figure out like, okay, what's what what's stopping you from like going further? Is it your stipend is very small? Like, you know, do you need like money for books or something like that? Um, I think that that could also be a clever thing to do. Yeah. Um, and are there any thoughts that you would like to leave us with? Um, something that we haven't covered yet, but you'd like to mention anything that you wish you were asked? I don't think so. <laughs> My mind just went blank. Um, no, it was a great interview. It was <laughs> covered a lot. <laughs> Yep. Thank you so much, Holly, for having joined us today. I'm a huge fan of your work, and I'm sure that it will go a very long way in helping animals. Thank you again for all that you do and for your time. I can't wait to read some of your next work on wild animal welfare. Thanks.